an ever-changing world, Life Changes Network presents a voice of truth and inspiration, broadcasting on frequencies of love, laughter, and information, illuminating new paths for new directions as we, as one, strive for higher and higher planes of existence and a better understanding of ourselves and the world in which we live. Always remembering, Life Changes. This is radio like you've never felt before. This is Life Changes with Filippo. And now your host... Our MC, the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Ciao, everyone. I am Filippo, and I am excited about today's show because we have Marshall Klarfeld on the show. Now, uh, unfortunately, I didn't know his name or him uh, until uh, very recently when I got to spend a little bit of time with him and learned that in his research, because he is an investigative researcher and an author, uh, he has discovered some really amazing things that to other people was just, um, how do we put this? To other people, what they were seeing did not indicate anything special. But Marshall is able to see something very special in what he is seeing in the world, in dirt, in plain sight, in archaeological finds that other people cannot see or have not been open to seeing. And so I can't wait to talk about uh, what he has found. I like uh, that we called this show The Proof is in the Pudding, or in this case, In the Dirt and in Plain Sight. So that's what we're calling this episode. And it's interesting because this just this morning I received uh, an article that uh, actually our producer Dorothy sent me from the Huffington Post uh, written by Dennis Merritt Jones. Um, the article is called Reverence Thyself First, um, where, the sa- uh, where the Sacred Journey Begins. And in it, it talks about weeds. He talks about how he was looking in his garden and he saw weeds and he wanted to get upset about the weeds because he had actually gone into the garden to meditate. And there in the place where he wanted to meditate, instead of being amongst beautiful flowers and plants that he had planted there for the purpose of his meditation, he found weeds, which he did not plant there and were, of course, unwelcomed. And it reminded me of two things, something that happened a long time ago and something that just happened this weekend. A long time ago, I had the pleasure of meeting and spending time with Louise Hay and She walked me through her garden, a garden that she personally obviously had spent a lot of time and money and energy and put in a lot of love to create as beautiful as it was. And while we were walking, she saw a weed. This was a garden without any weeds, but there was one and she saw it and she went up to the weed and she said, I love you. You're beautiful, and you have every right to grow. Just please don't do it here. And then she pulled the weed out of the dirt, and she threw it over the fence (laughs) into the ravine near where she lived, or next to where she lived. And I, right now, then and now, I think that's a beautiful thing. Because, in a way, the, the weed will give whatever the rest of its life to the dirt and it'll make more weeds or whatever it needs to make on the other side of the fence. But she didn't condemn it and she didn't say that it was bad. She just said, I would rather you didn't grow here um, while she's occupying that space. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really, really interesting. Another thing that it reminded me of this article by uh, Dennis Merritt was that growing up, uh, in the Sicilian uh, community that I grew up in, on occasion, some people would bring my parents uh, qualeggia. I don't know how to call this in Italian, but it was, I mean, in English, um, or even in Italian, because that's a Sicilian word. But this qualeggia was uh, a green, much like other greens that we eat. And it was one of my favorite and in still today is one of my favorite, but you can't find it in the stores. Although I think it's more delicious than most of the greens one buys in the store today, but you can't find it, at least not in America. 
At least I haven't seen it. And I have looked because I like it a lot. And it's interesting that I spent some time this weekend with a friend of mine. And at one point, we were walking through his garden. And he saw a weed. And right away, his energy changed and thought, oh, well, actually, there were a lot of weeds. And all the same kind. And I could just see that he thought, oh, another thing I have to do, I have to weed the garden. And so he was seeing a lot of time and energy into him needing to pull those weeds and 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 get rid of them, etc., because they were messing up his garden. Interestingly enough, what I was seeing was mouth-watering gualedra. That was gualedra, what he called weed, what he was disappointed in seeing. I was delighted, and I wished I could have just plucked them all up and gone right into the kitchen and cooked them up because I knew they would have been delicious, and he probably would have enjoyed them too. But reading this article uh, by Dennis Merritt-Jones on in the Huffington Post reminded me of both these situations where in one case one can say oh this weed is bad and get upset with it where louise hay would just say you know uh, please don't grow here and remove it and then in the other case where he was seeing a problem i was seeing delicious food in the same weed quote unquote and so i thought it was appropriate besides there are many lessons there uh in those two stories I thought it was appropriate to mention both of these uh, since they just kind of happened um, today because of our guest. Because our guest, Marshall Clarfield, could look at some of the same things that many archaeologists and scientists uh, have been looking at for years and where they see nothing or just cobblestones or, or nothing interesting. He sees something that could change the way we think of ourselves and our history. And so we're grateful that he does that. And at the very least, we can expand our thinking around certain things. We're going to find out what those things are when we come back and talk to Marshall Klarfeld right after this. Clean water is not enough. Reverse osmosis, distilled water, and most bottled waters are devoid of naturally occurring minerals. They are acidic, unstructured, and hard to absorb and rob minerals from the body. Ionways ionizers produce a super abundant supply of powerful antioxidants in each glass. Ionized water has a reduced molecular cluster size and a negative charge, hydrating you up to six times better. Water from an Ionways ionizer will help you restore your body to its natural pH balance, boosting your vitality. And ionized water more effectively flushes acidic toxins from within your body. Drink the healthiest water available today. Ionways Water Systems, their water changes everything. To learn more about Ionways Water Systems and how you can own one today, visit our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our sponsor page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Ciao, we're back. And I can't wait to have this conversation with Marshall Clarfield, who is an investigative researcher who has collected scientific and historical facts to prove that humans are, get this, are you ready? Descendants of extraterrestrial visitors. He says this is the biggest news of the century. He's an engineer turned investigative researcher. And he says once the public has seen the facts, which hopefully we'll get to see tonight, and at least here, uh, and of course you can find in his books because he's also an author, uh, they can't help but accept our history as descendants of extraterrestrial visitors. The evidence, he says, is overwhelming and irrefutable. We welcome to the show Marshall Klarfeld. Welcome. Thank you. Filippo, this is That's a this, great thing. Go on, please. I appreciate your introduction, and I, I really think that uh, the more people that uh, examine the facts as I have are going to come to the same conclusion that I have. And um, I put it all down in my first book, and I think that's a place where people can begin to go on this journey 
uh, with us because it's the truth. I uh, I was skeptical in the beginning, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret, Filippo. Okay. I read Zachariah Sitchin uh, 10, 12 years ago, right. and I was convinced that he had something positive to say about where we came from, but I wasn't sure. And I started writing Adam the Missing Link to disprove Zachariah Sitchin and his theory, and it ended up finding out that uh, he was correct, and I'm now on a journey as kind of his disciple because he's no longer with us. So I, I'm out there uh, spreading the word as best I can through people like yourself, Filippo, who are very generous and wanting to talk with me. Well, actually, I was fascinated after I spoke with you, and actually your skepticism is one of the reasons why I I. Uh, you, I was endeared to you because as an engineer myself uh, from that study, uh, I too approach many things as a skeptic. And uh, much like uh, somebody that I admire and that we got to interview a couple times so far, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who got into his research uh, not believing in all of these things. And all of a sudden, he's not only a believer, but he's out there uh, preaching uh, the truth as he sees it. You uh, won't believe something until you have hard facts. So if you are believing this, that means... You have the hard facts, and I can't wait to hear them. Well, I, um, as I say, I was skeptical, and I'm, I'm an engineer like you, and I'm a tire kicker. You know, I have to touch things and feel them and look at them and, and understand how they work. My uh, curiosity has always been, how does that work? And everything I look at, I uh, want to know how it works. And when I looked at us, and I looked at Darwin, and I studied uh, the Bible and I had all these stories rattling around in my memories. And I said, you know, there's got to be a story here that makes some sense because each of them have holes in it. Darwin has holes in it. The Bible has holes in it. And uh, I came across what uh, I now call the genetic engineering theory, Filippo. In other words, it encompasses both evolution and uh, Darwin. I mean, uh, intelligent design, the Bible. Uh, creationism is uh, partly right. Evolution is partly right. I think genetic engineering combines both of those and makes it totally right because the folks that I'm most interested in researching are the Anunnaki. And the Anunnaki, uh, as explained in the Samarian cuneiform tablets, were those who came here hundreds of thousands of years ago in the search of gold, which was what they were uh, questing after, and uh, the history of what they did, why they were here, and the creations that they produced are in my first book. And I think if you connect the dots, as I did in the book, you'll come to the conclusion that um, we are all descendants from the same uh, Anunnaki DNA. In other words, we share their DNA because they jump-started a species that was here on the planet called Homo erectus. And Homo erectus was a creature that had no voice, had no vocal cords, and its brain size was a third of ours. And if we evolved from Homo erectus, because they look like humans, uh, wow. there should be some skeletal remains uh, between our species, Homo sapiens sapien, and them. And there aren't any. So that's why I called my book Adam the Missing Link, because there is a missing link. And uh, the story of genetic engineering tells how this advanced space age uh, species called the Anunnaki took their DNA, scooped out the egg of the female Homo erectus and put their DNA in the nucleus and planted it, that egg into one of their females, an Anunnaki female, and she gave birth to the first Homo sapien, who they called Adamu, A-D-A-M-U. Of course, the Bible, it's Adam. Everybody knows the story of Adam and Eve. And from there, uh, the story just continues. There's just more and more evidence that we share uh, the heritage. Every one of us on this planet has the same DNA as the Anunnaki. If you look at the human genome, Filippo, there's over 25,000 genes. It took a billion dollars to find all these genes. And guess what? There's 223 <clears throat> alien genes in the human genome, which the scientific community can't really assign anything to because they have no predecessors on the 
evolutionary chain. They just are there. Well, I say they're there because the Anunnaki put them there and that we share this same DNA and we are evolving, as Darwin predicted, into a space age species. And we've come from, say, our origins, which Leakey found in Southeast Africa, skeletal remains of our species, Homo sapiens sapien, 250,000 years ago, 200 or 250,000. And for a species to come from that short period of time in the evolutionary scale of things to walking on the moon in 1969 is unbelievable. It does not happen in evolution. That's one of the holes in Darwin's theory. Species just don't come from nowhere and become space-age uh, individuals without some kind of interference or inter- whatever what you want to call it. I think it's called genetic engineering because what they did is what we're doing today for our females who are infertile and can't produce children. We take their egg and we fertilize it with a sperm of either their husband or a donor and plant it back in the womb, and it becomes a a life. And that's exactly what they did. Only they took uh, Homo erectus, which was a creature species, and we developed from them with the help of the Anunnaki's DNA. Now, Marshall, uh, you know, uh, we don't have the the ability to obviously, or I don't, to have uh, Stitchin on the show because he's no longer with us. But there are have been people that wanted to be on the show that want to talk about Anunnakis. And it's not that I don't believe them or that it, they're not credible. There's some wonderful people. But they talk about um, having been contacted by uh, the aliens or aliens or extraterrestrials or our brothers and sisters, whatever you want to call them. And they talk about how, this same story from the perspective of being told this or having had a download. What what made me most interested in having you on the show is because we're of, of, of like mind, I think, that if, like you said, you can't kick a tire, then you 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 chances are you're not going to believe it. So where is it? It's not as if that I see an Anunnaki that somebody has taken the DNA of or, or you know, you don't have... Um, you know, how do you have proof that this egg came from a Homo sapiens sapien or something? And, you know, where's the proof that you see for yourself? Well, in the cuneiform tablets, as uh, translated by Zechariah Sitchin, he did over 2,000 of those uh, translations. They tell the story of what they did. And this translation says exactly what I just told you. In other words, I didn't make that up. Of course, that comes from some research where I read what Sitchin wrote, and Sitchin said he translated what the Anunnaki had written in the Samarian civilization of what they did. And I think that the evidence here on Earth substantiates what they did, because we have uh, on our planet some of the most marvelous constructions and and, uh, objects of uh, our uh, anthropology or archaeology that are unexplainable, unless you bring in an advanced space age technology. I mean, you, you're an engineer like me, and technology has to advance and has to be passed from civilization to civilization. Every advanced civilization that encounters an aboriginal civilization imposes their thing on them and transfers technology to them. You just look through history, it's just replete with this transfer of technology. And what we read in the cuneiform tablets is that they jump-started a species that they couldn't communicate with. In other words, the Homo erectus couldn't speak. And if you can't speak and understand, you don't have the intelligence to understand, you're kind of just a creature. And here they said in their stories that they needed a primitive worker to help them gold, go after their gold mines. So in creating Adam by jump-starting uh, Homo erectus, which is the only species we have evidence of the skeletal remains that they were there. In fact, they were evolving for a million eight hundred thousand years to the point where they advanced to hitting two stones together and throwing spears. That's about as far as the technology got. To us who, like I say, we walk on the moon in 1969, and that just doesn't happen without something special in the evolutionary chain. 
You, no, you know, it's I, funny, Marshall. I've had some interesting theories along those lines too. Not not that far back, but as recent as the iPhone and the iPad. It's like, well, how did we get from these computers that take up big buildings uh, just to be able to calculate one plus one equals two to all of a sudden right. we have that in the palm of our hand and it does so much more than that? Right. Well, I, when I was at Caltech in 1947, I'm dating myself now. I was a freshman. Uh, there was a room next to where I lived, Filippo, where it was 30 feet long, 15 feet tall, and 15 feet wide, and it was filled with vacuum tubes. It was the first computer. Mm. And when they turned the lights, when they turned this computer on, the lights on campus dimmed because mm. it sucked so much energy mm-hmm. to run it. Now here we are holding in our hands little instruments that do vastly more calculations and communications than, than we ever dreamed possible. And every year, like you say, it upgrades, it gets faster, the uh, equipment inside gets smaller, and uh, we are really bursting with new inventions, and it's coming from somewhere in our DNA. We have this uh, background. Mm. Well, Marshall, I know when when we were together, you showed me some pictures of, of things, and, and if you're not able to show them here, um, I know people will find them in your in your future books as well. But I'd like to talk about some of the, the archaeological finds or some of the studies that you've done along those lines that that are proof. As soon as we come back, right after this, we're talking to Marshall Klarfeld, who's author of. Adam, the missing link, and Gilgamesh ten, which uh, <laughs> I, I'm seeing pictures already. Um, so we'll be able to uh, hopefully see those in a little bit. When uh, those of you who are going to be watching us on computer, uh, uh, otherwise, if you're listening, you'll have to just get the books uh, at some point. But we'll be right back with Marshall Clarkfield right after these messages. There are self-help seminars costing thousands of dollars guaranteeing miraculous transformations. There are compelling speakers and life-changing weekend experiences where you can walk on fire. They all deliver revelations that guarantee you'll come back for the more expensive revelations filled with even greater wonder next month on Fiji. We get addicted to positive, heartfelt, expensive theater. What we really need is a jumpstart, an awakening, someone who can give us a reminder that everything we need lies within. Through inspiration and practical knowledge, Dorothy Donahue helps people get grounded and motivated, inspired and energized. It's not just words and affirmations and the power of intention. It's a mindset brought about by a tangible, transcendental experience, an audiovisual, physical, spiritual experience that helps us realize we transform ourselves. We get tools to become the conscious co-creators of lives of unlimited potential. Find out more. Go to DorothyDonahue.com. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with our host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can hear tonight's show and all our past shows, which include luminaries such as David Wilcock, Mariel Hemingway, Giorgio Sukalos, Marcy Shymoff, and Shadow Stevens on our archive page at our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O dot com. Remember, you can also connect with us via Twitter and Facebook and now in our own community at lifechangesnetwork.com, where real people come together to share real life in real time. That's lifechangesnetwork.com. Well, we're back. I am Filippo Voltaggio, and this is Life Changes with Filippo, and we're talking to Adam. I'm Adam. <laughs> His book is Adam the Missing Link. His other book is Gilgamesh 10, and the guest is Marshall Klarfeld, and he's an investigative researcher, an engineer, and obviously an author. Uh, we've been talking about some interesting things here. We're going to see some pictures here pretty soon, but before um, we do, I just want to let everybody know that if you're interested in the book, you can go to adamthemissinglink.com to get uh, at least that particular book. Uh, so, uh, Marshall, uh, welcome back. And s- what? Let's talk about hard fact proofs. That okay, you- the evidence you want. You know, I'm the tire kicker. Now, here's a picture of what's called a cylinder seal. A cylinder seal 
was made out of hematite rock, which is as hard as steel, Philip, as you know. That's got a hardness of six or seven. Mm -hmm. To engrave it in the negative as these cylinder seals were done, and then roll it over wet clay to produce this picture, takes a technology that even today we would have difficulty doing because if you think about these seals as being 4,500 to 6,000 years old, the technology that was around at that time to engrave something, a rock that is hard as steel in a negative, and then show pictures in such detail. I don't know if you can see this, but it shows what I think are self-portraits of the mm-hmm. Anunnaki. This mm-hmm. is a cylinder seal that is very famous, and it has, uh, they have high high heel shoes, you know. <laughs> it's really amazing, the, the details. But up in this corner... If you it's if given, you hold it close enough, if you could hold a little closer, actually those are that? Jimmy Choo. Those are Jimmy Choo high heel shoes, I think. Okay, <laughs> but up here is is a replication of the solar system, our solar system, the sun, and all the planets engraved in in uh, scale. Right, and you know, in those days, people could see maybe five planets. But this shows 11 planets, including the one that they came from, which is now in our solar system called Nibiru. Right, and which that's, is a, something else that I want to talk to you about, N- Nibiru. Um, so, so you're showing us that in this hematite rock um, that we would have... It's magnetic, too. They're, they're like little magnets. If you ever got your hands on one, you can put it against steel and it'll stick. Um in order to engrave that, in the these things are about this size. In other words, I'm holding up my pen, right? And it's about an inch and a half tall and maybe three quarters of an inch in diameter. And to go wow. around the surface of that small object with this negative engraving, so when you rolled it on wet clay, you got a positive picture story that would last forever. Now, here's a device, Filippo as an engineer you appreciate, that transfers information over thousands and thousands of years. Now, there's information on that cylinder seal about our solar system, about the plow, about what they look like. We do not have a device. Believe me, all of our CDs, DVDs, uh, memory sticks, whatever you have, are going to be gone in 100 years. They won't last. They've created a storage, information storage device that has lasted thousands of years. We have much data, which we're storing now on uh, very fragile storage systems. And if we want to tell the future a thousand years, two thousand years from now, what we were all about, we better figure out a way to store our information so it doesn't deteriorate. You understand what I'm saying? I, I do. Where did that technology go? How did we get so dumb all of a sudden, if that's what happened? Well, it wasn't us. It was them. It was the Anunnaki. What I'm saying is if there was an advanced civilization here and they had all this technology and they were trying to help us out or to increase our ability to take care of ourselves, because if they have some responsibility for the jump starting that they did, uh, they might have this feeling that uh, they, we need to learn these things faster than we normally would through evolution. Evolution is a very, very slow process, really, but it takes millions of years for things to change a little bit. Mm. Here we have a magnificent jump in our ability from 250,000 years ago to today. And every day, you know, 100 years ago, we weren't flying. Mm. Right? Right. you got to explain. People have to try to understand that those are not normal phenomena. We, we accept the fact that we're flying around first in airplanes, then in rocket ships, and then we're, we went to the moon, and now we're building the capacity to go further into our solar system and then eventually out beyond our solar systems into outer space. Mm-hmm. There's a whole community out there. If you look at the... I had a fascinating professor. His name was Richard Feynman. He was my physics physics professor. And Dr. Feynman could see into the future. And uh, he believed in the law of probability, Filippo. And the law of probability is that bell curve. 
Mm-hmm. If you do something enough times, you're going to get the same uh, bell curve answer. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, he said, you know, I asked him, do you believe in UFOs? It's in my book, by the way. I quoted him on uh, his answer. And he, he, in my generation, is the he was the Einstein of my generation. He was so smart, he could answer the question before the professor asked it. That's how quick he was. But he said that there are 10,000. The law of probability says there's 200 billion stars in our solar system, in our uh, galaxy, the Milky Way, and there's 400 billion galaxies in the universe, maybe. Mm. And if you take that number of things, you're going to get 10,000 little solar systems just like Earth and the sun. Exactly. This is the law of probability. And he said, of those 10,000, we're the youngest because our star is only four and a half billion years old and the solar system 14 and a half billion years old. So he said, if any of the other 10,000 survived their space age, yeah, they could have come visited us. And I said, then you believe in UFOs? He says, well, that's, that's how they got here. So here's the most scientific mind I've ever encountered, one of them, at Caltech. Mm-hmm. Telling an undergraduate student who asked him, Dr. Feynman, do you believe in UFOs? And he gave me the law of probability. Okay. <laughs> the law says, the law says yes. Um, so tell us, uh, you were talking about a hundred years ago, we didn't have this or we didn't have that. A uh, hundred years ago, at least, not that I recall, did we ever talk about Nibiru? And so in the last couple of minutes that we have here together, what about it? Is this, this is actually a planet? Yes, yes, it has been recorded by uh, ancient civilizations. The Greeks called it Nemesis because when it comes in on its 3,600-year orbit around the sun and comes into the inner planets between Jupiter and Mars, its gravitational uh, force has a great effect on the planet Earth. It causes earthquakes, it causes volcanoes to erupt, it causes ice shelves to slide into the ocean, causing tsunamis. That was the story of the Great Flood. And... The people before them, the first ones that, that gave it a name were the Samarians. And the Samarians called it Nibiru. The Babylonians called it Marduk. Uh, the Indians called it something else. I mean, in my book, I give about five, seven civilizations that have seen it every 3,600 years. You have to be around every 3,600 years to see this thing. And the only ones that didn't uh, identify it were the Romans. Except, in my calculations, they should have seen it But the story from the Romans was it was the star of Bethlehem. Oh, but but with the star of Bethlehem, the only story I know of around that is that Jesus was born. Um, That's right. No no earthquakes or major national disaster or world disaster. Not that were recorded. Not that were recorded at that time. Okay. Interesting. The Great Flood. The Great Flood happened 3,600 years, and on 3,600 years cycle, 11,500 years ago, and they said they knew it was coming, and they knew that the temperature on the planet Earth had heated up so that the South uh, Antarctic ice shelf was loosening and that the tug from Nibiru was going to slush it into the ocean down there and cause a tsunami, which was going to wipe out civilization. Now, the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh 10, or our book, Gilgamesh 10, which is based on their story, the Epic of Gilgamesh, tells the details of that story in a very interesting fashion. We take people back in a screenplay format where they can be part of the scene at Uruk 4,600 years ago, uh, just before the flood occurs. So um, it's an interesting uh, book, and the reason uh, my wife and I produced that book was we wanted people to understand the history as it was written and translated from the cuneiform tablets of what the flood story was all about. The Bible tells one story. Every civilization on the planet has a flood story story. Mm -hmm. But I think that the 11th tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh tells what might be the original story. And that's why we brought it to the public's attention, so they could read it and learn what maybe really did happen. Marshall, I, I, th- though this has been a short time and it has gone by very quickly, I'm happy that we've connected yet again. and that Well, maybe we can talk further on this, Filippo. I'm I, available to you whenever you want me. 
Thank you. I'd like that because I feel like we've just merely scratched the surface. And for those right. who want to know more, you can always reach um, Marshall and get his book at the Adam the Missing Link dot com. That's Adam the Missing Link dot com. So look out for that book and also for Gilgamesh Ten. Gilgamesh Ten, which sounds like it'd be a really fun read, especially since I'm also into into acting. So I might see myself in four thousand. You could put both roles, Philip. You know, it's a dual role, and there's the king, who's a big guy, okay, and then his, his clone is Enki Do. So there's two parts. One person, one actor could play both parts. Okay, I'll just pick. I'll choose twin. the king. They're twins. Oh, they're twins. All right, I'll yeah. do both. I'll do both. But with that, we have to go. And Marshall, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm so glad we met, and I look forward to us meeting again very soon. Very good, Filippo. Thank you okay. very much. You have you and Mary have a great evening, and thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. We'll be right back with our producers' wrap and Mark Lejour uh, right after this. Life Changes with Filippo is a premier radio show presented by Life Changes Network, which is a company whose team has dedicated their lives not only to positive change, but to helping others observe and embrace, honor, and even celebrate their own changes, thus enabling a more positive, inspired life and helping to create a more positive okay. and inspired world. From everyday people to corporate giants, celebrities, and children, we are here to help and to serve. With heart and experience, we bring our message and positive intent into your home or corporate office and even through appearances on your favorite shows. If you wish to learn more about Life Changes Life Coaching and a private consultation with one of us, corporate event appearances, or if you would like us to appear on your radio or TV shows, visit LifeChangesWithFilippo.com and click on our representation page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, we're back. I am Filippo Voltaggio, and we've been talking to Marshall Klarfeld, uh, investigative reporter, and talked about some great things. And with us is... Mark Lejeur. Mark Lejeur, indeed. Mark. We're descendants from Anunnaki's extraterrestrial somethings. Of course we are. Of course we are. You knew that. Of course. <laughs> well. It makes a lot, heck of a lot more sense than, than half the stories we've been given. I, I know. But that's, the, that, that's according to law of what the heck do we know. Yeah, that's yeah. The one I subscribe. What the heck do we know? Yeah. What the heck do we know? I mean, seriously, because it just blows. Okay, everything I learned in church, everything I learned in school, everything it just out well, the window. That's where I gave up on on the organized aspect of of my religious upbringing was when all the stories didn't make sense, and when you would learn things that weren't taught in science and or were taught in science. And then, and then, uh, you know, we're we're uh, we're conflicting with other things you would learn. You know, mm. the, all of the archaeological discoveries now that are coming up, and the the monolithic structures, you know, under the water and and all over the globe. And you know, I was watching one of those big uh, uh, documentaries on uh, on one of the cable stations the other day, and they're talking about how they're moving a two thousand ton. This, that, or the other is the biggest crane in the world, and blah blah blah. And we just got done looking at the, another documentary where they have twenty thousand ton rocks. Who moved those? <laughs> How did they do it? What the heck did we know? <laughs> so you know, the, 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 I subscribe to the idea that any of this is possible. And the more you look at this, the more you're willing to challenge what you were taught, and the less you rely on that as being fact, the more some of this stuff makes sense. You can't tell me it's coincidence that there's cave drawings of yeah. spaceships yeah. all over the world. Yeah. You can't tell me it's coincidence yeah. that, you know, that, that there's written works that describe similar events all over the world. Which Marshall said, right. And they're finding more and more of that. And so, the, but and then we're just denying that that at a time when people were trying to jockey for a position, 
you know, years and years and years ago of trying to control their well-being and their livelihood that they wouldn't control certain information in order to try to get their team to win. I think that's possible. People do it today. That's, that is interesting. And, you know, it's funny when you start saying, well, religion, the stories in religion don't seem to add up completely. So that's when I thought, you know, I was studying to be an engineer and I thought, well, here are the answers. These people got it. The religious should talk to the scientists. But then afterwards, when you start to look outside of that and you say, they don't seem to have it either. Well, you know, do they not have it or do they not want to share it? And I think that's the interesting part. That's on both sides, then. Is this on both sides? You know, the, the, it's the the idea of challenging conventional wisdom are, are really comes from those that are concerned with the greater good and the sharing of whatever the truth may be. Mm-hmm. Anything that challenges conventional wisdom that's then fought is challenging a control system or an ownership system in one way, shape, or form. Yeah, you know, we're able to talk about things these days on a level that, that we weren't able before. Even even me, um, or even I, as a child, when I used to hear about vegetarianism, whether or not it's the right way to eat or it's the healthiest, I don't know for sure, but at least I accept that there are people who are vegetarians. But as a child, I, I was taught to make fun of that, so we used to make fun of that, not knowing why, when a ch- another child, their parents said, we eat this way, and then we make fun of that child. Everything is strange until it becomes normal. <laughs> yeah. Right? You, you eat raw fish. That was, was something that was unheard of in the Midwest where I grew up, and then suddenly mm-hmm. sushi's all the rage. Right. You know, chocolate-covered grasshoppers? I don't know. It's a delicacy all over the place now. You know, what becomes... No, that's it, weird. Okay. That's weird. Uh-huh. <laughs> But, but it's gross. So <laughs> any of that, well, because you didn't grow up with it. True. They probably think that sushi is gross. Yeah. Right? So there is there is the whole... Or hamburgers. The, 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 the yeah. weird condition. We rely, humans rely on our conditioning. And then those that are in control positions play upon that conditioning in terms of how information is shared and or manipulated. And, and that's the interesting thing. So now you go back and you start saying, what is possible and what isn't possible? Well, we can clone. Right. We've now proven the fact that we can identify down to the molecular structure uh, the solution to most feelings and most chemical processes in the human body. Who's to say that there isn't a higher existence, just like we do with lab rats and possums and guinea pigs and everything else wouldn't say, hey, let's take this dude over here with no vocal cord and put it with that really big dude from that other place, whatever you want to call it, Marduk, Naburu, whatever, and put them together and see what happens. Let's watch them for a while. Yeah. It's possible. Does it sound crazy? Sure, it sounds crazy because we don't know anything different. But we, you know, it was just as crazy as cloning sheep. And that's what I liked about Marshall, because if you can convince an engineer who's a skeptic to begin with, and who doesn't need to believe or want to necessarily, uh, but it's like the, the, the evidence is there enough for him, right now it's kind of good enough for me to expand my mind. You know, I, I think that the evidence, the knowledge that's out there, especially with the Internet and the, the rapidity of, of disclosures and of processing and of the satellites out there and the data that's coming back, is so overwhelming that it's almost embarrassing the narrowness of mind to refute a lot of these possibilities. Don't necessarily have to believe them, but to outright say something isn't possible, to say there isn't alien life, to say there isn't, that's absolutely ridiculous when you look up in the sky and look at the, and and now we know for a fact, we can extrapolate the number of, of universes or the number of galaxies and the number of universes. You know, kind of like uh, what came to mind is that there was a time when women couldn't vote in this country. And and now we think that's a ridiculous thing. But at the time, there were real debates. Like, do you really think a woman has enough intelligence to vote? Or do you really think? And it's now, what a ridiculous thing to be talking about. And maybe someday... This the aliens com- will be able to vote. <laughs> yeah, the aliens will be able to vote. I stand for alien rights. I wonder if they'll have some sort of a delegate. 
<laughs> well, if they don't, yeah, I want to be... from Sirius, please stand up. <laughs> from Sirius. From Are you Sirius? Sirius? Um, no, but seriously, someday we'll look at this conversation and say, did we really have that conversation? Were, were we really that naive to, to, to be saying, wow, we might actually come from extraterrestrials when it is so... It, be, it will become... Like all things, like you said, in a, in a way, self-evident. You know, it goes back to the thing I always say is the fact that we have proven and people accept certain things and yet don't don't um, believe what's possible based on what they've already accepted. Right. We're all vibration. We're all energy. Atoms are energy. So it's everything you see and perceive is just a structure of energy, which now means anything's possible. So the stories of the virgin birth and this and that, we, you know, and whatever, whether it's genetic, whether it's energetic exchange, whether it's just a manifestation of thought form, we know a heck of a lot more now that makes all of those stories plausible. And I so like the it. idea of denying any possibility, is that's where I fall short. I like it. And now all of a sudden the Adam and Eve story kind of makes more sense, ironically, uh, when you think of this whole, you know, we, that was crazy, and this is crazy, but this actually makes that crazy make sense. So, um, but the people that wrote this craziness know more than we do about our own galaxy, about our own solar system. They built structures right. to, to the level of detail, to the level of precision, <laughs> right. that they're now proving not only aligned with our galaxy, but other galaxies, right. but other planets within our galaxy, according to the certain, you know, the wobble of the, you know, it's, it's endless, the amount of knowledge that was there for these rock-carving Neanderthals that walked around right. with sticks and stones and learned how to have fire out of nowhere. Come on. Right, right. I obviously Marshall Clarfield had has started a conversation and if you want to continue the conversation you can of course continue it with us on our network at lifechangesnetwork.com uh, you can obviously uh go and get more of uh information from Marshall himself by going to adamthemissinglink.com and getting that book and Gilgamesh 10 uh, in the meantime, we'll be having more conversations here on Life Changes with Filippo, but we are so glad you joined us today, and uh, let's let's keep going. Thanks for being the change that we all wish to see in the world. Ciao, everyone. You have been listening to Life Changes with Filippo with the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Listen live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the BBS Radio Network and visit us online at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles with Dorothy Lee Donahue. To learn more about them, visit the sponsor page of our website. Once again, join us here next week as we consciously explore and embrace the only constant, life changes. Change, 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 change.